Okay, so we have a 46 year old female with no significant past medical history. She was referred for first time average risk for cancer screening. She was really asymptomatic, no medications, normal vital signs and exams, and unremarkable basic lab. So, pretty straightforward case. Um, we took her for colonoscopy and we ended up finding four two to three centimeter sessile polyps in the ascending colon, a 2.5 centimeter sessile polyp at the hepatic flexure. Um, we removed everything with EMR and then we scheduled her for a repeat colonoscopy to be done within six months. <clears throat> um, this was done at Ansonia, so unfortunately we don't have video, but um, you can see these were actually pretty hard to see and we found, started finding them on our second look. Um, but you can see there's kind of these smooth, flat polyps that are encompassing the folds, and they're actually a lot bigger. If you go around the other side of this middle one, it actually extends kind of on the other side and beyond. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see some of our EMR sites, but there are some pretty large, kind of smooth, flat polyps in the ascending and hepatic flexure. And so the pathology came back um, all as sessile serrated lesions. Um, so I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about uh, serrated polyposis syndrome, or SPS. This is the first time I've personally seen it. Um, it's important to be able to recognize um, and important to know how to surveil these patients because there's a very high risk of development of colorectal cancer. Um, so I tried to find the most recent kind of review article on SPS because there's been some changes in the uh, diagnostic guidelines. So this is from 2021, the Diagnosis, Epidemiology, and Management of SPS. Um, so a little bit on the background, um, SPS is a rare syndrome characterized by multiple serrated polyps throughout the colon and rectum. Like I mentioned, strongly associated with colorectal cancer, um, accounts for potentially 10 to 15% of colorectal cancers, um, frequently unrecognized. The prevalence is unclear for that reason, but it's estimated to be below 1%. Some studies say less than 0.1%. Uh, the mean age of diagnosis is about 50, and the molecular characteristics have not been fully characterized at this point, but thought to involve things like BRAF and KRAS, along with kind of the other serrated kind of lesions leading to cancer. Um, so this is one of the important slides. So this is the diagnostic criteria. There's an updated 2019 WHO uh, criteria. Previously, there was a 2010 guideline that uh, was a little bit more complex. So luckily, this one's a little more easy to, a little easier to remember. Um, so you just need one of any of the following to, to make this diagnosis. So the first would be the presence of at least five serrated lesions proximal to the rectum, at least five millimeters in size, with at least being two, at least two being greater than ten millimeters in size. And so for our patient, she had five uh, sessile lesions that were over ten millimeters in size. So she met the criteria for SPS based on this first first uh, point here. Um, the second one is more based around number, so you can have over 20 serrated lesions or polyps of any size throughout the colon, with five being proximal to the rectum. Um, so the next kind of important clinical point is the surveillance strategy. So overall, it's recommended that you do colonoscopy every one to three years in these patients, with resection of all polyps greater than five millimeters, ideally resection of all polyps that you find. Um, of course, the caveats, caveats being if you do any piecemeal polypectomy greater than 20 millimeters, you have to bring them back to make sure everything's resected. Um, if there becomes at some point an inability to adequately surveil these patients or remove polyps, then it's actually recommended to consider colectomy in these patients. Um, and then they did mention that if no polyps were detected, you can actually apply in the interval to five years if you're comfortable. Uh, personally, I'd probably keep these patients at three years just because they're so high risk and it's so hard to find these polyps. Um, there used to be really no guideline, uh, no guidance on first degree relatives in screening, but um, this paper at least talks about um, thinking about beginning screening at age 40, beginning at the same age as the diagnosis of SPS in the family, or beginning 10 years younger than the earliest colorectal cancer diagnosis in a first degree relative with SPS. So some of those kind of go along with what we already do, but I'm um, just important to think about at least talking to first degree relatives and being a little bit more careful with their screening as well. And so the conclusion here, so SPS is rare, under-recognized syndrome, highly correlated with colon cancer. Um, the kind of easy way to remember is just five or more large SSPs or 20 or more SSPs of any size, and you can make the diagnosis with either one. Um, survey with colonoscopy every one to three years. 
offer early screening and first degree relatives. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what? Why did you decide to use hot instead of cold? Um, they were just pretty large and broad based, um, so we just figured we wouldn't be able to cut through with cold. But I think cold snare is a good tool, and if they were if they were a bit smaller, maybe we would have tried it. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a family that has this the the entire family, brothers sisters, all the twenties or to early thirties. They all have multiple oh. large serrated adenomas. But I had a dentist wife come to me who was referred for colectomy. She had about 30 to 40 sessile serrated adenomas. And I took them out in about two or three sessions. And I explained to the dentist, we don't get paid per, per tooth. <laughs> <laughs> we only take about 20 to 30 of them. We just take them out. <laughs> so, but, you know, you, could, you just have to be very patient about getting them all out. And it, so you yeah. can save them a colectomy. It just takes time. Yeah. Do the guidelines talk at all about the role of offering like an upfront colectomy for people that just have it a lot on like their index colonoscopy, or they're still recommended to just yeah. try and risk This it. paper didn't talk about going straight to colectomy. I think you, do, you should just probably bring them back for frequent colonoscopy. But if you find that you're just not able to ever get control of all the polyps, then it's definitely an option, yeah. You usually can. I mean, Jim's experience is, is a good one, and I think we've all had a <clears throat> few of these patients. You just every few months, every three to six months, because they don't progress necessarily super fast. Um, and then you just kind of continue to scope them and get their burden all the way down. It, it's a bit different from the Lynch syndrome patients, which make these subtle flat polyps kind of quickly. Um, I, 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 I guess I'm now old enough to know this used to be called hyperplastic polyposis syndrome. Um, and we just find these huge fold, like like these whole folds, be these big subtle yeah, polyps. That's not how it sounds, yeah. um, <laughs> and so, uh, and the other thing to note here is remember it's five, it's polyps proximal to the rectum. So sigmoid hyperplastics, sigmoid sessile serrated do count, which really changes the number a yeah. lot. The other thing to point out is uh, polyp sides. Um, we are all horribly bad. At um, <clears throat> yeah, doing the size stuff, and I don't think I realized how bad I was till we did a trial uh, with Doug Rex's group, and then we had to actually take a snare and photograph it on top of the polyp. And I, I I'm, I'm very consistent in how often I overcall. <laughs> and so, if you think about the small snare that we use here at MSH, it's a 13 millimeter snare. And their polyps that I call, oh, this is easily two and a half centimeters. And I put the snare, I'm like, ah, oh, damn, it's 15. Um, and so I would bet if you thought about the size of the snare and you open it up over the polyp, these were probably much smaller than uh, you think. Because a three centimeter polyp is enormous. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but just take a look at the packaging I, um, of your snare. And then when you open it up, you'd be like, oh, wow, I'm actually way off. The interesting thing about our path, I don't know if you've seen this before, but the pathologists actually, because I know your tissue will shrink. Yeah. But they actually, yeah. they, uh, where is it? They shrink a lot. They, they actually, well, I guess an aggregate, but they talk about the size. I don't know if that's reliable. No. Not. Because especially if you're suctioning it through the channel, and then now what you, and you also like, you, you crimp it up when you snare it. Um, it's, it's, and if it's multiple pieces, then they're just measuring the glob. That's true. Um, well, imagine them trying to carefully piece together. Yeah, I've never seen them do that. Yeah, know. Alexi's great at puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they do that. It's why our ESD specimens, we also pin them and stretch it out because oh, okay. that's why they, they tend to shrink down. We also can orient the pathologist to um, to what sort of you know cranial or caudal approach. Okay. That that works. And it does make it look bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I think one other um, important yeah, endoscopic finding is, is that uh, the classic mucus cap. Yeah. You know, the mucus cap is so um, so telltelling when you're when you're doing colonoscopy, and um, before you even get your equipment ready to go, you know it's going to be an SSA, so you want to be sure that you really get it out with good margins. So. Yeah. Yeah. These were hard to see. Yeah. yeah. The mucus cap is so classic. You can also, if you use a submucosal injector that has coloring dye, the borders stand out a lot better on these sex ulcerated. So it's another important point. If you're, you're going to do an injection. Identify the borders. You can also use um, additional imaging like NBI to help as well um, and pay close attention to the near pattern. Some of our scopes have near focus. You can really zoom in and look at the pit pattern to tell where the where the bore ends because sometimes they're they're subtle and tough to yeah. pick up. The um, polyp doesn't pick up the dye. So. Yeah. 
So sometimes if I'm not sure, I'll inject, and if the whole fold turns blue, I'm like, oh, okay, that'll help. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, all right, today I'll be presenting a case of a 42-year-old female who um, came to us in November presenting with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, and she had this history of having an intragastric balloon placed in the Dominican Republic um, about six months prior. Um, and since the procedure, she was saying that she was having this constant intermittent nausea, vomiting, very bad uh, PO intake, but as a result, had lost 45 um, pounds, so that was great. But over the last 10 days, you know, she had had this worsening intensity of pain, and it was very hard to even keep liquids down, and that's what prompted her to come to the hospital. Um, so to show up the CT. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the whole point. Balloon, um, that's quite large. It's was potentially overinflated in the stomach. And so this was um, presented at BI actually, and um, they were referred to us for uh, removal of the balloon. So entering um, the esophagus here, you see at the junction you have the balloon. Um, it's quite large, but kind of when you distend the stomach and look at it in retroflexion, uh, um, you can appreciate the size a little further, um, clean it up and really distend it. And if you distend the stomach, it actually is not that big, but um, clearly when the stomach has collapsed, as you can see on CT, the, it's quite large. So in order to deflate it, you get this um, kind of needle out and you have to be as perpendicular as possible so that you can actually insert it deep into the balloon um, and then allow um, all the fluid to come out. So it's always good to intubate these patients because you can have this gush of fluid come out. Um, and also this is methylene blue. And the reason uh, they have a little methylene blue in the fluid. And the reason for that is if it does pop for the patient, um, the patient knows that it's popped because their urine turns blue or green. Um, and so you you don't want too much of it to spill into the in any case, um, then we tried removing it. We have these um, V-shaped forceps. Um, you have to kind of get it at the angle of one of the folds in order to grasp it because it's such a thick silicone balloon. Um, total, I think we removed for this patient like 750, 800 cc's of fluid. So it's definitely over distended. Typically we like 500 cc's in the balloon for most patients. And you can see the balloon fully collapsed there. Then we went back in um, and suctioned out whatever little bit of methylene blue was still um, left in the stomach, and we were doing like our final exam. You see that there's some ulcers created by the balloon as well. So this is um, a complication that can be seen with these um, intragastric balloons, uh, a couple superficial ulcers and um, one cratered ulcer. No stigmatic bleeding, so we put her on a PPI, and she was discharged, but and she hasn't followed up with us since. All right, so today I wanted to just briefly touch on endobariatrics, um, specifically talk about intragastric balloons. And so, um, as you probably know, you know, you can, if you lose 7 to 10% of your total body um, uh, weight, then you can really improve obesity related complications. So, that's um, where end endobariatrics comes in because they're many times reversible, such as intragastric balloons. But in addition to that, there's ESG and um, this newer procedure where both of them involve plication of the stomach. ESG is more um, plication of the body, um, as you can see here, versus the post procedure, you get. Um, uh, plication of the fundus and the um, kind of top part of the body. But those are um, uh, also intended to reduce the space of the stomach and some hormonal regulation. And then there's the um, aspiration therapy where um, the spire balloon was, is like a drainage or venting pipe that's used um, into the stomach so that food can just come out. Um, we used to use these aspire tubes as drainage pipes at school. Um, <coughs> So there are multiple FDA-approved intragastric balloons, um, but the ones that are uh, available commercially are the Obera and SPATS-3. This is from a review in uh, 2022, and I was asking Nikhil this morning um, if it's, the Obelon is still out, because I was seeing that SPATS-3 was available in the U.S., so it's, I guess, very recently been made available, and now the Obelon is, is out, so it's the Obera and the SPATS-3. So we'll talk about you know, the three ones um, next. Um, so the way they work is, um, of course, they're space-occupying lesions, so or space-occupying balloons, and so it, it prevents food from um, entering and staying uh, 
um, you know, entering the stomach, but it also just promotes early satiety by activating the stretch receptors. You get um, more production of receptors for the GLP-1 um, molecule, and we all know GLP-1 agonists are, um, uh, you know, important for weight loss, and GLP-1 is important for weight loss. And so, and the other thing is if you activate the stretch receptors, you can stimulate the vagal nerve, and this can result in delayed gastric emptying. So these are the mechanisms by which it works. Um, so the, um, I want to go over three of the balloons. So the Ovalon balloon, which now is no longer um, commercially available here, but was commercially available up until last year, um, it's a swallowed balloon. So that's nice, um, where they, they have a pill kind of that's attached to a catheter that they swallow. Um, and then they inflate it with nitrogen gas. That's about 250 cc's. And then every um, month or so, they you swallow an additional pill so that you get three balloons in total. Um, and then about six months, they um, can be removed. But for the removal, you actually do need um, you know, to do an endoscopy, and it would be a similar removal process to the one you saw. Um, the Obera balloon, which is the one that we endoscopically removed, um, needs to be endoscopically placed. So essentially, you have the balloon attached to a catheter. When it's deflated, it looks like this. You put it down, you um, inject uh, fluid into this catheter, inflate the balloon, and then def um, the catheter is, um, can be removed. So then this uh, fluid full catheter um, or balloon stays in place for six months and then it's removed like the way we saw. And then third, the uh, newer one is SPATS-3, and this is an endoscopically placed balloon, but it's adjustable. So this comes with a built-in um, catheter that uh, you can put fluid in, but that catheter stays attached to the balloon in the patient's stomach, so that if the patient is having um, not having adequate weight loss and not really feeling the symptoms of nausea and all of these common symptoms that maybe you should feel if you have a balloon in your stomach, you can actually go back and um, do an EGD and uh, pull that uh, blue part out uh, of the mouth while the balloon is still in and in inject more fluid into it um, so that you can expand the balloon further. Or alternately, if they're having symptoms like our patient did um, and it wasn't time for the balloon to come out, you could um, pull that um, the blue part out and actually suck more fluid out of the balloon and deflate it a little bit. So it's more adjustable and allows for more weight loss and more patient comfort. Um, so adverse events, um, the top one here is just what happens when you have the balloon in place. So they can have nausea, abdominal pain, vomiting, um, reflux, burping, and these kind of things. And that's just very common. But the adverse events that you really see, the more serious ones, are gastric perforation, balloon uh, migration. There are some um, few cases of death associated, but gastric alteration is common. Balloon hyperinflation, as we talked about. Um, the, usually, we put a, about 500 cc's of fluid in the balloon, but um, sometimes, depending on who you know inflates the balloon, more fluid can um, can be placed in the balloon that can cause more um, discomfort. Um, and then acute pancreatitis is actually a um, uh, adverse event we see as well, and that apparently the mechanism is because the balloon is pressing on the pancreatic parenchyma and potentially compressing the pancreatic duct that can result in um, acute pancreatitis. And so. Um, in a study that looked at over 5,000 patients, um, just based on tolerance, about 6% of patients needed um, the balloon removed earlier than um, intended. So I wanted to review this paper that was in the Lancet by the Chris Thompson group in 2021 that looked at the efficacy of the SPATS balloon, which is the adjustable balloon. So this um, was a prospective multi-center, used um, seven centers, open label randomized controlled trial, um, looking um, at patients uh, age 20 to 65 with obesity. They randomized um, the patients two to one um, with lifestyle modification or with intragastric alone versus intragastric balloon and lifestyle modification for 32 weeks. Um, and they used the balloon volume to um, facilitate either weight loss or to um, help them uh, tolerate the balloon better. And they looked at two endpoints, one being the mean uh, percentage of body weight loss and one being the responder rate. Um, and they, it was an intention to treat population analysis. And so results-wise, um, at 32 weeks, the intragastric balloon group had 15% um, total um, mean um, weight loss. Oh, I didn't mention, the SPAS balloon can actually be in for eight months total versus the Obera balloon's for, uh, six months. Um, and so the, at um, 32 weeks, 15% um, had weight loss compared to only 3.3% of the control groups. So obviously, that's, that's significant. And the clinical response, which their target was 5% of total body weight loss at 32 weeks, um, uh, 92 patients actually achieved, that, uh, percent of patients achieved this. 
And then this uh, graph here looks at um, the adjustments in the balloon gate. So they, they showed that if you if the patient um, needed was tolerating it and um, and they injected more fluid into the balloon and kind of increased it, and if they were not tolerating that volume and kind of decreased the volume over time, um, they were actually able to um, uh, get an additional 5.2%. Um, weight loss for these patients, um, and by having the ability to um, adjust the balloon volume and remove fluid, um, they were um, able to keep 75% of the patients, um, you know, more comfortable in this study and on the study. Um, the question always comes about the durability of these, though, once they're removed, because obviously these are they're intended to be. Uh, reversible um, weight loss strategies. So in this study, um, the, um, of the 144 patients um, that had weight loss results that were available at six months, they followed those patients for another, uh, for a total of 14 months. And they say that um, the weight loss was achieved in 74% of patients, um, maintenance was achieved, and they, it's kind of weak, but they, they define it as 75% having 40% weight loss maintenance, um, which was, over 50%, but this is all like, you know, we're at what, six, five, six percent weight loss total right now, rather than the 15% that we'd seen before. So you definitely lose it. Um, but then another study has come out that adds the GLP-1 agonist to um, the balloon to see if a combination treatment after could be useful. Um, so these patients had the spats. They were removed in, um, after the eight months that the spats were supposed to be in. And then they were given the um, GLP-1 agonist for nine months total after. And then they were able to show that the patient was able to keep the weight loss off at that point. But then the question always comes up if you remove the the GLP-1 agonist, and they're probably better. Or can do a GLP-1 agonist alone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so adjusting adjustable interferon therapy is definitely a future piece of the balloon part of the industry. Um, but the durability of all of this is really, really important. Why was um, Mobile On taken off the market? It was a production issue. Um, and actually, a lot of companies suffer pretty heavily with uh, COVID. So actually, the Aspire Assist, that company is now um, financial ruin has been dissolved. Um, Reshape was taken off the market because the company that owns Avera acquired them. Um, there actually is a, a proceduralist balloon that's currently under FDA study, which is known as the Ellipse Balloon by Valorian. And that one is a, a capsule that gets swallowed, and then the balloon gets inflated after you check an x-ray to make sure that it's Below the diaphragm, and then after four months, it sort of self disintegrates and passes through the GI tract. But um, balloons actually, as of January 1 of this year, do have a CPT code now. So um, the tide will be, you know, shifting a little bit. But I think the argument about pharmacotherapy up front is a very valid one because, particularly with the GLP 1 agonist, semaglutide, which is <clears throat> um, uh, Wagovi and Ozempic at the lower dose, and then Manjaro, which is a GLP-1 agonist and also works on GIP, actually has in the diabetes data 20% low body weight loss. So it's even higher than you know the balloons. I think those are going to be really um, important you know players in the in the management of obesity. And I think we're going to be heading towards a lot more pharmacotherapy up front, and then maybe you know combination um, down the road. But with pharmacotherapy, there's cost, so these pills are like, it's like $1,000 a month. There was a shortage recently of Wagovi. Um, and then in addition to cost, there's also the attrition rates that you have to be mindful of. So um, the, just one other point about the six month follow-up. You know, if you think of BC as a chronic uh, disorder, that's, that's really not gonna tell you much about the long-term efficacy of the, of the spats balloon, so. There, was some, there were some studies that are being done about using this as temporary weight loss for like transplant patients and stuff they did. Um, mentioned that, but um, there's not much robust data, and like a lot of those patients have kind of adverse outcomes with the balloons in place because they're already so sick, I believe. Yeah, so we're exploring that issue here actually for uh, liver transplant, and actually the heart failure and heart transplant group is interested in this um, because these procedures you can place the balloons under, you know, conscious sedation or modern anesthesia, um, so they're, and they're pretty short. Uh, so it's an area that we're, you know, exploring with those groups to see if we can optimize some of these patients before going to transplant. We've had a couple of patients here prior to like kidney transplant that have 
um, gotten insurance approval before the CPT come out, code came out, um, varying degrees of success with those patients. Pre-transplant, pre-wedding. Pre-transplant, yeah, pre-transplant. <laughs> 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 I 